Didcot, Oxfordshire, in the heart of England's countryside with its landmark cooling towers, home to Williams Grand Prix Engineering. Winners of four Formula One World Constructors Championships and three Drivers Championships and current outright leaders in this year's contest. From this base, boss Frank Williams and his eager team have sent out the cars this year which have carried Nigel Mansell and Ricardo Patrese to the forefront of the challenge for the World Drivers' Crown. Here are the current positions after the first seven races of the season. Work begins here at sunup in race week with some of the unsung heroes in this story of success, the truckies. Peace and serenity of this French sunflower field is to be broken this weekend by the sound of speeding trucks. They're all off to Nevers, capital of the former Duchy of Nivernais, 90 miles southeast of Orléans on the banks of the River Loire. Its bridge links Paris from the north with Magny-Cours, venue for round eight of the Formula One championship, and in a display of unparalleled arrogance, French truck drivers have chosen this week to stage a protest about new motoring laws. This blockade, designed to cause maximum inconvenience in Grand Prix week and severe embarrassment to the French government, is one of a hundred such demonstrations up and down the country. Thankfully, the Formula One drivers have made it through the blockades to the unpretentious Hotel du Cirque at Magny Cour. Ah, so here we are after about three weeks from the Montreal Grand Prix. We've been on holiday down to Wales for two or three days. When I say holiday, two or three days is a holiday. Uh, we then went to my golf and country club where I'm president. Um, in Dartmouth, in Devon. Uh, we opened the golf course down there. Since doing that, we've opened uh, Harrods um, Summer Sale, which was in London a few days ago. We were testing extensively at Silverstone and was very, very quick there, uh, because obviously straight after this race, we go straight into the British race at Silverstone. And of course, here we are again this week, and uh, in the midst of, no doubt, you've seen all the problems and trouble and strife of uh, the French truck drivers. Well, we've got a glorious morning. Um, the forecast for tomorrow is rain. It's raining currently in a lot of parts of Europe now, and especially in England. So I think it's very, very important qualifying today. 
Um, I think the qualifying times will probably stand today, so we've got to get our act together and uh, hopefully we'll be back on the front row where I think we, uh, we deserve to be. The 4.271 kilometre circuit of Manucourt was purpose-built in the homeland of the French President Francois Mitterrand and hosted its first Grand Prix last year. Nigel won here then and he dominated today's first qualifying session in fighting fashion, lapping in 115.047 ahead of his teammate Ricardo Patrese and the McLarens of Senna and Berger with Schumacher and Eric Comas next. And to complete the perfect day, a game of golf. As you can hear in the background here, this uh, racetrack is one of the best, purely and simply, to have a golf course right on the edge of the circuit. Here we are playing golf. It's rather infuriating the noise, but at least we're out on the golf course enjoying ourselves. Back to the hotel now to catch up with today's news. William is back to uh, the old ways today, one and two on the grid. Provision. Yeah, fantastic day today because uh, you know we had our problems. I lost my race car in the morning in the last 40 minutes and I had to run back to the pits and use the T car. And to go the quickest in the T car this morning and then uh, virtually be quickest in the T car this afternoon or did the same time as my race car, it was very, very pleasing. Which engine are you running? So we're running the RS3 and the RS4 and uh, we're doing more or less the same times at the moment. But we've made modifications to the car and uh, although the weather forecast is not very good, we, we hope to improve tomorrow. And you were half a second quicker than Ricardo? Yeah, just half a second quicker than Ricardo, which is, which is a lot here. I mean, I'm very pleased to be uh, half a second a bit quicker. Um, but it's the gap then to the McLaren which is astonishing. It's about uh, one and a half seconds then to the next McLaren and that's very good. The perennial question, who will drive for whom next season? Seems to reach a climax usually with, with Silverstone, which comes up next week. Any inside info on what's happening at Team Williams yet? No, um, only the fact that they're talking of uh, the possibility of Prost coming, although that's being denied. Um, I can stay and uh, be there if I wish to, or I can go to Ferrari if I wish to. Um, I'd never go uh, to McLaren, that's for sure. Um, what's happening at McLaren? I think you'll probably still find Senna and Berger there. Ferrari, uh, definitely John Lacey staying there. Maybe Capelli, maybe someone else. Um, it's still very much in the air at the moment. And I mean, if Prost were to come to Williams, how would you sit with that? No, we'll just have to wait and see what does happen. Okay, just uh, one final thing if, uh, on a lighter note. Um, in the English press this week, I don't know if you noticed it. Ayrton Senna, your old mate, was, was stopped for speeding on the M25, 121 miles an hour in his Porsche, and uh, the policeman didn't recognise him, and he said, Oi, who do you think you are, Nigel Mansell? Well, I mean, really, you should have locked him up. Any Brazilian going more than 100 miles an hour in the English roads should be deemed as very dangerous, should be locked up, and the key should be thrown away. And, of course, I say that with a smile. Nigel went on to continue contractual discussions that evening with the Williams commercial director Sheridan Thin. Saturday morning and the road from Nevers is almost impassable. The roadblock being mounted even under the nose of the local gendarmerie. Oh, good morning everybody. Today, uh, I think McLaren uh, have got to sort themselves out. They found themselves a long way behind us yesterday, and I think they had problems for sure. Uh, the Benetton team, I think they must have had a few problems too. So um, it's going to be a tricky one. Again, patience will prevail. 
Uh, no doubt you must have uh, demonstrated some patience coming here this morning. Um, you'll see quite a lot of the truck strike, I should imagine, on this particular episode of uh, the French Grand Prix. That's it really, other than the fact that uh, because it's uh, like it is this morning, I've had to get up uh, earlier and go to work a little bit earlier. I was hoping that it was pouring with rain this morning, and if I'd have looked out the window and it was raining, I could have spent another 30 minutes in bed. However, we can't and uh, we're off to work, so see you later. While Nigel went to the circuit, we dodged the lorries for some rather more attractive French delights, the vineyard. The great chateaus of the region own acres of vines, regimented and manicured to perfection. And it's here in Puy that Sauvignon Blanc grape is grown, ideal for summer drinking. Many houses here are connected with wine production, like this local worker of 27 acres of Sauvignon, producing bottles of Puy Fumé and Sancerre with great skill. And of course, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Cheers. But no obstructions for Nigel back at Manicor with a record-breaking lap. We've had a, a very indifferent day where it's been dry, it's been wet. We've had uh, that in one session, so we've actually practiced in wet conditions anyway, which is quite good because now if the race is wet tomorrow, we won't have to have extra practice. Um, the track conditions and the temperature being cooler today uh, obviously made it a lot faster. We've actually smashed the track record. We've now got down into the 1 minute 13.8 second bracket and uh, my teammates next with 114.3. And then you have the McLarens of Ayrton Senna and Gerhard Berger coming up next at 115.1 and 115.3 respectively. So uh, we've had to go a lot quicker this afternoon to protect the front row. Okay, on a very quick lap um, of the circuit here, many cores, you come out of uh, the fast chicane here in second gear, accelerating to third, to fourth, to fifth. I'm just going to pause there and let you know that this part of the track here is where the pits are. This is all the pit area here. So that's the exit to the circuit here, and you come around here into the pits. This is the actual racing circuit, so you change in second, third, fourth, fifth, under the bridge, and when you go under the bridge here, you're doing about 143 kilometers an hour. Accelerating down here, getting into sixth gear about here, and at this point you're doing 270 kilometers an hour. And you can see it's a very short straight, and yet you've accelerated from basically about 60 kilometers an hour up to 270 kilometers an hour in a very short distance. Very, very fast slingshot here towards the chateau. And then from fourth to third, round here in third gear, probably the speed at this point here, going entering the corner is 270 kilometers an hour again. And then going through here at probably about 140 kilometers an hour. From third to fourth to fifth gear. That's the most fantastic thing about a Formula One car. You see how short this straight is, and you're accelerating from third to fourth to fifth, I'm probably doing about 220 kilometers to 240 kilometers an hour at this point here. So the most important thing for tomorrow, because the start and finish is uh, here, or the starting line for the race, is to get a great start and get into this corner of complexes the first if you can. And then through here, very important that your car is very quick onto the main straight, because this is your main straight. This is the only real opportunity for overtaking down here coming into the hairpin. And hopefully, we'll get a good start, we'll have reliability, and you never know, we might have another great result tomorrow. Thank you. Sunday dawns with some unpromising weather. The biggest thing is, is the wing setting for the car. It's when the conditions are like this, how much wing to, to run. Why I say that? Because if it does rain and you're running too little wing, you're going to be slow. If you run a lot of wing and it rains all the time, you're going to be quick. But then if it dries out, you're going to be slow. Um, 
it's what we call the chicken and egg situation. If you could really know exactly what the conditions are going to be for the race, we can put the best wing setting on for the car and then for sure we'll be competitive in all, all types of condition. Well, this is the right place to be, isn't it, this morning? Yeah, I mean, on a day like today, there's only one place to be, and that's out in front. And uh, at least we've got the pole position to start with. We just need a great start now and uh, try and maintain that position. And if we can, then uh, I think uh, the advantage is ours. All right, we'll see you later on. Nigel sets off one last time to the circuit with his wife, Roseanne. Will he attain his sixth win of the season by being first to the chequered flag? Or will his teammate, Ricardo Patrese, resplendent in his racing helmet for the short trip to the circuit on his moped, apply the pressure for his first success of the season? The contraflows are still operating, slowing down the circuit-bound traffic. But somehow the big coaches get through to Manucor with a little help from the local gendarme. The police have devised alternative routes to keep the tide of traffic moving. But even they need to resort to the map to find out just where they're going. Mid-morning now, and the queues are at their worst. This is just one of six entrances to the circuit. Nigel doesn't get the start he prayed for, and Patrese is first into the corner. A dogfight follows between the teammates. Rain brings out the red flag to halt the action. After the restart, rain again, and in comes Nigel for a tyre change to wets, and it's fantastically quick, just over five seconds. He slithers back onto the track and drives superbly to win his 27th career Grand Prix. Patrese comes home second and Martin Brundle finishes third and shares his first podium celebration with the Williams drivers. Nigel now has 66 points in the drivers' championship, ahead of Ricardo on 34, Schumacher 26 and Senna with only 18, not finishing in the last two races. It's a century up for Williams in the constructors' table, and nobody really looks capable of stopping them charged to the title. Nigel arrives exhausted at the busy heliport outside Manucor circuit. He's now equaled Jackie Stewart's 27-win record. Another trophy to add to the collection. Yeah, it's fantastic and, uh, I mean, you saw it was a very hard race, it was a long one, stop, go, stop, go, and, I mean, just marvellous victory, very, very good. It was an eventful race, tell us about the original start. Well, Ricardo drove fantastic today and, uh, we're having a big fight and, you know, Ricardo's a great driver and, uh, then at the second restart, uh, both starts, uh, I was pushing him very hard and we were having a big fight. And he uh, decided that the pressure on him that I was pushing was maybe too much because he started maybe to make a mistake. So uh, he decided to let me go and uh, I thank him very much for that. We're back online and uh, we got another 10 points and I'm so happy for this. And a great preparation for Silverstone next week. Yeah, Silverstone's next week, it's only four days away. Well, very well done again, many congratulations. Good to see you all. Welcome you at Silverstone. I'll invite you into my personal compound within the circuit and uh, we can have a chat one evening and even a barbecue. Bye-bye. Well done. Fabulous. Bye, Roger. Two days later, motor racing personalities attend an award dinner in London. A chance now to ask Jackie Stewart about Nigel Mansell equaling his record. Well, I sent Nigel a telegram, or a fax actually, saying welcome very temporarily to the 27 Club, because I'm sure he's going to be a very short time member. 
but of course I'm very pleased for him. It's very nice that this amount of success has come in the manner that it has. And of course he's a worthy, worthy person to have knocked up 27 victories. I can't complain, I'm very pleased for him because I've held this record now for 19 years. So uh, I'm just pleased that there's another British driver up there winning as often as Nigel is. And we can only hope, I, I'm sure he shares my opinion, that we can develop more young British racing drivers who will be able to continue to get the kind of success that hopefully both Nigel and I will be overshadowed by with young British drivers. And at the moment, that's not really happening as well as it should. And Ayrton Senna, what are his chances? To be realistic about it, I think we have uh, very little chances uh, in this year championship um, of course as long as mathematically it's not over you have just to keep on trying but uh, definitely the Williams Renault combination is the favorite one is the dominant one and um, I think we will unfortunately continue that way until the end of the year at least so We'll keep on trying. We, even though, even with that situation, we managed to win two races with the McLaren. And uh, who knows? Uh, it's always unpredictable a racing result until you get a checker flag. So you have to make sure you be there at the right time, at the right moment, for any opportunity that can come, so you can collect it. The rolling countryside around Silverstone in the county of Northamptonshire braces itself for its busiest weekend of the year. And everywhere, even the fields are rented out for Labatt to reinforce its message. And there's no doubting the focus of attention for the next few days. Well, welcome here to my home Grand Prix, the Silverstone Grand Prix. And as you can see, the weather's been extremely kind. It's pouring with rain. But I've got a smile on my face because I'm going to be performing in my own country. There's no problems with language, there's no problems with accommodation or food. You're here in our tented village, and I'm going to ask you to join us for a great game of golf tomorrow, and I'll guarantee, I'll predict the weather tomorrow will be very good. How's that? I'm going out on a limb, especially for you. So until tomorrow morning, I'll speak to you later. On a greyer day than predicted, we head for the tranquility of the golf course. Nigel's preferred workplace when he's not in the cockpit of his Williams Renault FW14B. This time it's Buckingham Golf Club, about four miles from Silverstone. And today finds Nigel in good humour. Uh, things are very, very good. I mean, what could be better, I mean, gentlemen? I mean, it really is tremendous, isn't it? Come on, come on. <laughs> I'll, try. I'll try to get you in the water. He's done this job before. <laughs> Now that would have been really good if you'd have done that. I've come across pranksters right. before. Fast going back to Silverstone now, back from Buckingham uh, Golf Club. It uh, was quite a fun game this morning, as you saw, there was quite a few people following us around. And albeit from making a bogey on the last hole, I would have shot level par, so I actually finished with a gross 71, which, uh, and that's a net uh, 64 or 65, so I'm really, really happy with that. We'll be going back there, in fact, later this evening, which uh, I'll invite you to join us to see how we've actually done in the prize giving. 
now we're um, obviously only about four miles from Silverstone now the intensity of the weekend will begin we uh, will go back I shall have a nice shower and change and and then I've got to go down to the pits and speak to my engineer and start setting the car up feel comfortable that everything is uh, as it should be because Although you speak from day to day on the telephone, when you get to the races, there can be a lot of changes on engines or, or even chassis. And my race car this weekend is a different chassis. I have a new chassis which hasn't actually raced before. And uh, I'm happy about that because the old car has done a lot of uh, miles now. It's done seven races and it's won six of them. Our format then will be, I have a press conference which is very important at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. This is for all the press worldwide if they wish to come. And then at 5 o'clock, um, between 4 and 5 you have a weigh-in as well. And then at 5 o'clock we are actually um, having a driver's meeting, an official driver's meeting, because we have some new regulations for next year that they're actually going to speak to the drivers about. So uh, an awful lot of things are going to be happening. And then, of course, this evening, straight after the driver's meeting, we'll come back to the golf club here. Then this evening, I would suggest probably as early to bed as possible, 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock if not, but then 10 o'clock is definitely the latest time. And then up first thing in the morning, 8 o'clock, breakfast, and uh, straight into it. And I'll be joining you for breakfast tomorrow morning anyway, in a special special studio that we have. and. We'll talk a little bit further then about tomorrow. Hello. Hi. Once we start, though, we're in trouble, aren't we? Back at the circuit, opportunity knocks for one fan in particular. She clearly can't believe her luck. There you go. Right. Well done. Love to see you. Thank I've been you. dying for this for ages. I was just going back for the rest. Yeah, how are you? All right. Oh, I'm fine now. <laughs> Oh, it's grand. There you go. <laughs> oh, thank you, you ever so much. Best of luck for Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And then Bye. it's straight to work, facing the world's media. What's the situation with the contract with Williams? Are you going to re-sign? Well, I mean, that's a heck of a question, and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was going to ask it. Um, well, it's brought me off, off there a little bit. Um, it's as simple as this that at the moment I don't know anything. Um, Frank and I have negotiated, we've more or less come to a uh, agreement on, on everything other than one thing, and that is who will be in the other car. And um, this hasn't been clarified to me yet. Um, there's obviously been a lot of speculation, uh, none of which I can verify, and therefore um, telling me can have the drive as long as it's regarded for crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Nigel. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I'll be open with you, and I trust that you reciprocate with me. Ricardo Patrese and I have worked collectively with Renault, with Elf, and the Williams team. No other driver, right? Ricardo, myself, and Damon Hill. And that's it, basically. Um, maybe uh, Martin Blundell before. Uh, McLaren took him away but between Ricardo and I as the main drivers of the team and racers of the team have worked with Renault, I repeat myself, with Elf and with the Williams team to get it where it is today. I feel very reticent as to why it has to be changed, if it's got to be changed. I wish I could say what is happening because you know I know how I feel at this moment in time and it's difficult for Ricardo even more than me um, but I mean that's it I can tell you who's not coming to the team but I, I can't tell you who might possibly be coming to the team and to be fair I've got to be open with all of you and say all of you please and this is tongue in cheek so don't take it totally seriously we all queue up at the Williams murder home and speak to Frank and Hattie <laughs> because one of you might be told something that we can actually go with. Just, 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 just,
This beautiful surprise floral tribute is from Interflora, made from over 3,000 individual flowers. And then it's back to Buckingham Golf Club for today's prize giving ceremony. 0 to 15, the winner's Nigel Mansell. 71. Nigel. Well done, Nigel. Well done, Nigel. Mm -hmm. Nigel. I think it's the oh, first time I've given you a well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. This is home for the weekend for Nigel, his family, relatives and friends. Camping out like thousands of supporters will be doing in a compound within the Silverstone circuit. Good morning everybody, well here we are at Silverstone, uh, lovely Friday morning, you can see if you pan around that it's uh, rained very very heavily in the night. It's just going 9 o'clock and in about 10 minutes time I'll be going down to the pits. A quick uh, brief with the engineer and, uh, and then basically probably about 20 to 10 I'll be sitting in the car at the end of the pit lane. Why 20 minutes before uh, the practice starts? Basically because it's my home Grand Prix and I'd like to be first out on the track because ticket sales are already 40% sold up over and above last year and uh, I reckon the crowd here even today will be something like 40 or 50,000 people. I think today with the weather forecasts are going to be very very important because all the times I feel will be set today in qualifying because I feel for tomorrow it's going to be raining. In a few minutes time I'll be going down to the pits obviously to get back in the car and uh, get out on the track very very first. The other thing that's quite phenomenal at this race which uh, will allow you in on is our little tented village here. We say tented but it's more caravans and motorhomes. Uh, my sister's here and various friends, long-standing friends of sort of 20 years ago and of course my family. And uh, we have a little crush here as well. We have something like about uh, seven or eight children and everybody gets on real well. The only problem we have got is that uh, to the side of the soccer pitch is a little bit muddy but this evening I'll uh, ask you to join us and perhaps you can actually be referee because if it stays dry and it does dry up a little bit you'll see quite a phenomenal soccer game tonight which will be very very interesting and perhaps even some of the people here can start playing too all right I've got to go got to dash as ever we're against the clock uh, you think we just play against the clock uh, on the circuit, but off the circuit it's almost a race against time just as intently as it is on the circuit. So literally, we will catch up with you later. Thank you very much. Silverstone's marvellous 5.225 kilometre track is one of Nigel's favourites. And in first qualifying, he smashed his own lap record in an astounding 118.965. The provisional grid lines up like this. Mansell and Patrese in familiar places, Senna and the others in their wake. Back to the camp, taking care of a little bit of business with his financial advisor John Rothero in yellow. And greetings for Alex Plusko, his Florida architect and wife Barbara, and Nigel's loyal assistant, Donald. Oh, did we watch? Well done, Nigel. Congratulations, Nigel. You certainly gave them something to chat about today. That was a very, very special one-hour qualifying session, and I think uh, enough for a few years here at Silverstone. You'll see uh, see a car go that quick ever again. I think. You told the press conference yesterday that you didn't think it would be possible to do a lap much quicker than 1.199, and here we are today. You've knocked a full second off that. I'm but, motivated. And it's two seconds quicker than your qualifying time this time last year. Which engine were you using today? We were using the RS4 and the car and the engine worked perfectly. We've had a few little problems, but uh, you know, I've got to say that I'm immensely happy. And I don't think I can go quicker than that. I mean, that was a sensational lap and uh, that's it. How did you got the car set up for today? Well, I mean, uh, we've done a lot of homework here, a lot of testing. So we're very fortunate that this is a track very close to our factory that we know the circuit very well. I call this circuit a bit of a specialist circuit. I know this circuit inside out and we're able to set the car up very well for here. And I foresee that uh, on full tanks we should be equally uh, competitive. I noticed when you came back there you've got a slight limp. There's nothing serious there is it? That's because I almost fell off the bike. 
<laughs> my dead leg, my leg getting on it. The crowds here are just incredible and, uh, you know, they don't leave you alone too much, so uh, it's a bit of a problem. Now, we all know that you've got a love affair with this circuit and you've won a few races there, but can you put exactly into words what it is about Silverstone that's so special? Yes, yeah, it's in England. It's as simple as that. It's in Great Britain. Uh, we were born here, round here, and, you know, it's, it's our home Grand Prix. We only have one a year, and that's basically what's so special about it. I have a, a great affection for the crowd, and they reciprocate, and you know, it's just tremendous to operate in this environment, and then to live in this tented village is fantastic. A bit of fun next, as Nigel gets hold of his eldest son Leo's <laughs> water pistol. His youngest son, Greg, joins in the fun, squirting his father. And daughter, Chloe, completes the trio. Even Williams commercial director, Sheridan Thin, gets caught up in the battle, ambushed by Leo. But play is soon over for Nigel. Here comes the BBC television crew for an in-depth, exclusive interview. <laughs> when the sun goes down, the soccer starts. Early next day, all is quiet in the Mansell camp. Peepo!
In a field near the Silverstone main entrance, the day begins as well for thousands upon thousands of happy campers. When practice starts at 10 o'clock, the peace of Silverstone village is shattered. Can you believe someone actually got married amid the wail of Formula One cars? Even the village hall does its bit to publicise the year's biggest event here. Rain. Good to maintain the beauty of these English country gardens. Bad news for others, but good for Nigel back at the circuit, as no one can get near yesterday's time. We're very pleased because you've seen the day's conditions today. I mean, they are very, very bad, just as they were on Wednesday. And uh, I'm afraid that's the English weather, but we're very, very quick this morning. And uh, this afternoon in the wet conditions, we posted a quick time again. And so we've got set up for dry, all wet conditions. The problem we have got is with the new regulations, because if we start the race with dry tires and then it starts to rain, they won't red, red flag the race anymore. They won't stop the race. And it's up to the driver then to go into the pits and actually get the wet tyres when he thinks best. For me, that's a little bit of a lottery because if there's an accident or something and then they do red flag the race, you are then in the pits while everyone else is going round and you can be last on the grid. I've had grave res reservations about the new regulations and I suppose we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. But uh, ideally I'd really like it to either be completely wet tomorrow or completely dry. But this in-between situation that we've had the last few races with the new regulations is not desirable. Um, Ricardo got into a bit of a tangle there this morning, was that? Well, it wasn't a serious? tangle. I mean, we lost one car. One car was completely written off because Comas decided to come and T-bone him at 200 miles an hour. Comas didn't see the yellow flags. Uh, Ricardo started to slow down for an accident at the end of Hangar Strait, which is the fastest straight on the circuit here. And of course, Comas just came and T-boned him, took a couple of the wheels off, and then threw him into the concrete wall. And we've lost the car, and um, in him losing his race car, I lost my T-car. car And therefore, um, you know, the team are having to work real hard tonight because they've actually got to build another new car up tonight for the race tomorrow. So apart from the weather, where do you see your biggest threat tomorrow? Uh, no, the biggest threat is reliability, finishing the race, not making any mistakes, overtaking back markers, and of course my teammate Ricardo and the McLaren team and Benetton team. And will there be any team orders? No team orders tomorrow. It's not exactly a red carpet Donald's putting out for some rather special visitors to the compound, but everyone's eager to see them. It's Prince William, heir to the throne, wearing Nigel's cap. How fitting that the future King of England should visit someone else about to inherit a crown, the World Drivers' Championship. Well, the last thing we're going to do for you this evening is take you around quite a quick lap of Silverstone. Obviously starting the quick lap, you come out of woodcut corner in third gear, accelerating up into fourth, fifth and sixth gear. And past the start and finish line, you're actually doing 270 kilometers an hour. And then here you're approaching 290 kilometers an hour. Changing down to fifth, accelerating through here, probably still doing about 240 to 250. And then coming down here from 5th up to 6th, very quickly through maggots in 6th gear. This is where you're pulling 5G lateral. That's 5G force this way, and then that way you're pulling 5G in less than one second. So you're pulling 10G in less than one second. Then you're in 5th, then you're in 4th, and you're pulling an average of 4.5G through this corner. Incredible. Coming out onto chapel, 4th gear up to 5th, 6th, down hangar straight, actually reaching over 300 kilometers an hour at this point, braking very hard for Stowe, down to 4th, round Stowe, into 5th, down Vale, and braking hard here. You go from 5th to 4th to 3rd to 2nd in probably less than 1.5 seconds. Accelerating through here, pulling a lot of G through here, 
and actually the most impressive thing is how a, a race car, certainly a Formula 1 car, accelerates from this point to this point you've accelerated from 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th gear so you're actually pulling 240 kilometers at this point 5th gear into 6th gear and you're already 270 to 280 kilometers an hour at this point here and then up through bridge again doing 300 kilometers an hour and this on qualifying is incredible you take this corner in 6th gear flat out and I tell you, you got to hang on braking very hard 6th to 5th to 4th to 3rd taking all these corners now in third gear as quick as you possibly can Brooklands, Lafield and accelerating down here again towards the start and finish line third, fourth, fifth and sixth again absolutely incredible and if you can do that ladies and gentlemen you actually get round in 118.98 which just happens to be the pole position and virtually a clear two seconds clear the field. That is a quick lap and I wouldn't like to do another one like it. I don't think with the new regulations I certainly won't do another one in my lifetime. Thank you. The helicopter bombardment over Silverstone begins early on race day ferrying VIP passengers to the circuit to beat the traffic. Good morning everybody. Well here we are, nice sunny start of the day anyway. It's Sunday, obviously at 20 to 8 in the morning. Warm-up's uh, literally just over an hour's time. We've got to get uh, cracking and get into it. A lot of pressure on me today, but we'll see if we can come through. We've come through before, so uh, I think you'll find it a very interesting day, and I'll speak to you after warm-up, see how things go. Catch up with you later. Helicopter movements intensify by the minute, looking almost like scenes from the film Apocalypse Now. We had a great warm up, both cars working very well, and if I have to take the T car, which I hope I don't, then it'll be reasonably quick. Um, we're quickest again, which is nice, and the only thing that's against us now is uh, the weather. Um, as we're talking now, it's starting to spit with rain. And, Anything could happen, so uh, we just got to be, be a bit patient and just see what happens later on. You've got the T-car back, so they managed to put Ricardo's back together all right, Yeah, Ricardo now has actually got my uh, race-winning car of five, six races, because that was retired, and now that's the only car that's available, so uh, he's got a good car. And what was the atmosphere like out there this morning? The atmosphere is incredible. The crowd is just sensational, and uh, oh, it's marvellous, absolutely marvellous. They're still queuing up to get in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, last night we saw some people that had been there since they started queuing at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon to be first in at yeah. 5 o'clock this morning when the doors opened. Yeah, tremendous, isn't it? Traffic queues all the way back to the M40 even by about 8 o'clock. So. Very, very impressive. I'm glad I'm not going anywhere tonight. <laughs> so the plan now is a bit of lunch for you, is it? And yeah, I'm just going to have maybe? some pasta. It's ready now and then literally I'm going to try and get my head down just for sort of an hour's rest and just rest the body. Well, we wish you uh, all the best. And all right, and we'll obviously be speaking later, and uh, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. All right. Merchandising sells like hot cakes. Everyone wants a memento of what's sure to be a great day out. There are shirts, shoes, you name it, they've got it. The crowd is kept entertained by a full supporting programme of events. There's never a dull moment. Despite a bad start, Nigel takes a masterful grip on the race, eventually winning from Patrese by a mammoth 39 seconds. Nigel has to stop after the finishing line, engulfed by the delirious supporters, 
is literally dragged from the car and manhandled in an orgy of victory celebrations. He's now the most successful British driver in history. The sixth one two this season for Williams Renault. Nigel's lead over his teammate is 36 points with Schumacher on 29, Berger 20, Senna 18 and Martin Brundle making an impressive appearance on 13. A country mile separates Williams from the others in the constructors title. There's a hero's welcome home to the compound, a hug for Roseanne and yet another trophy to add to the collection. Well, hello again. I mean, here we are after the race, and what can you say except it's been a most fantastic day. A bit of history making as well, and two of my best friends around the world, Mark McNulty, who you met in South Africa at the beginning of the year, and I think you might have caught a glimpse of uh, Tony Johnson as well, who's sitting there. I think they enjoyed themselves today as well, and I wish I could still play golf as good as them there. Don't you know they get paid more money he than can. us? They he really can. He's just a, he's just a bandit. <laughs> They, they don't never give me enough shots, so they always beat me. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's been marvellous, hasn't it? And hopefully you've got some scenes of the crowd, and now we're just going to have a lovely barbecue this evening with a lot of people, which you can see around here, and just relax for the next number of hours. So I'll catch up with you later and personally talk to you about a few other things. As the sun sets once more, Nigel, his family and friends settle down to relive the earlier events of the day with the BBC's Highlights programme. And they enjoy it this time with Murray Walker's famed faux pas. which is the last corner of a one, they're breaking ranks, the Union Jacks are waving, and Nigel Mansell wins the 1992 British Grand Prix in terrific style. What can one say is about the scenes after the race, except that uh, obviously it'll be worrying for a little while, but I mean the crowd, I've never seen the crowd like it anywhere in the world, and although perhaps it was a little dangerous in places, uh, it was absolutely stupendous, fantastic, marvellous, and very, very flattering. With the exception of being pulled out of the car like a rag doll and various hands going places they shouldn't go, and being thrown around a little bit, uh, obviously it was fantastic, very enjoyable, and uh, as I said, and I'll say it to you, I dedicate my 28th and most historic victory to date to the fans in England and around the world. I don't think Ricardo had read the script, had he gone into the first corner, did he? Well, no, Ricardo hadn't read the script very well, had he? And uh, I think it just goes to prove that there isn't any team orders, and we've been saying that, and so I had to just remind him coming out of the first corner that, um, you know, I was shall we just say, in charge of this weekend. And then you made the jump to light speed. You're eight seconds clear after just three laps. 
Well, I decided I wanted about 11 to 15 seconds after five laps, and um, that way you can crush the opposition, and I didn't want to fight with Ricardo today, and I wanted to drive my own race, and the only way I could do that was to demoralise him a little bit, and sort of pulling out two and a half seconds a lap for the first sort of five laps was exactly uh, correct. And then with just two laps to go, you came out with the fastest lap of the day. The team wasn't exactly real happy about that, but uh, I must be honest and tell you to camera now that I did that especially for the fans. I wanted to, with the new regulations that are coming in next year, I wanted to put a fastest lap in and break the track record, whereby that would stand at least for a few years, and uh, so that's exactly what I did. I didn't over-rev the engine or even incre increase the engine revs uh, through the gear changes. I just brake very late and uh, just pushed the car to the limits through the corners. Very pleasing, but then the next two laps I went very slow. But I think the most incredible thing was Damon Hill, because the car he's actually particularly driving and trying to qualify is, is not, uh, well, it's actually fact the slowest car, and he managed to get into the race, and all compliments to Damon. I think in years to come you'll see a great star there in Damon Hill, and I really believe and hope that he gets the support that he justly deserves. I'd just like to close in saying that I think you've all witnessed a very historical day today. Well, I know for a fact that you actually have. I hope you've enjoyed this program, and perhaps this program has been the most special one of the year so far. Join us, and let's get straight into Germany, because we've got to remember, unfortunately, as I speak to you now, this race just gone is history, and we've now got to work so much harder for the new races to come. Come and join us in Germany, in Hockenheim, in one week's time. We'll speak to you then. Mannheim, Germany, a port and industrial city at the junction of the Rhine and Neckar rivers, 40 miles south of Frankfurt. Full of splendour and statues, the city also boasts an engineer who, as far back as 1885, made a petrol-driven three-wheel motor car. He was, of course, Carl Benz. His corporate badge now dominates the landscape over the university, where students prefer the two-wheeled bicycle and treat Benz's invention rather contemptuously as pure art. Benz's legacy is left in the German marks of Audi, BMW, Porsche, VW and Renault. The Renault, of course, belongs to Nigel Mansell, and he's the reason we're visiting Germany. His home this weekend is the Waldorf Astoria for round 10 of the Formula One World Championship. Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are, Friday morning. It's the 10th round of the Formula One Grand Prix circuit. We're currently uh, at the Waldorf uh, Holiday Inn Hotel, which is approximately about 15, 20 minutes away from the circuit. A bit later than usual this morning. Um, forecast 32 degrees, going to be very hot, possibly thunderstorms a bit later. Same sort of forecast for tomorrow, so as per usual, try and get the job done today, get on provisional pole and then whatever the weather has in store for us tomorrow, we can basically rest easy. So if it's dry, we can try and go quicker, but obviously if it's wet, we can sort of smile a bit, because then we've obviously done the job today. This time of the season gets more difficult to, I wouldn't say motivate yourself, but you know, it's, it's in the meat of the season, we call it. It gets tougher, and the races come very frequently. I'm very pleased to say that after this weekend, we will actually have a week or so's break uh, before the Hungarian Grand Prix. Special things for this circuit, aerodynamic package. We are currently going down three straights down here at about 340 kilometers an hour which is obviously very very fast indeed in miles per hour that's 200 and 215 miles per hour very quick slip streaming up to 220 very very important here to have the package of the car correct for the for the straights plenty of places to overtake very very quick not exactly one of my favourite circuits because of the chicanes, no real demanding corners. Perhaps a couple coming into the infield, but that's about it. Prediction for this weekend? 
I hope we'll be somewhere on the front row of the grid. I'd just like to pause for a few seconds and uh, say, well, we've just gone over half distance now. We are on the 10th round. Um, hasn't been too bad, has it? I mean, uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying making it. A lot of trials and tribulations here, a little bit of pit talk. I mean, uh, Enton Senna's threatened to resign and uh, perhaps have a year off, unless he can get my drive next year. Alan Pross is desperate for the Williams drive next year. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be doing next year yet. A lot of intrigue. Enton Senna and uh, Michael Schumacher having a little bit of excitement in the test here, depending uh, and deciding on who was correct and who wasn't on the circuit. And, it's quite lively in the Benetton pit for a few seconds. Um, I'm half smiling, mainly because I'm staying quiet. Get on with the job, concentrate, work as hard as we possibly can, and know. And see if you can't have a great weekend this weekend. I invite you with us uh, later on to catch up on the story of today. And also, it's for tomorrow. We have a function here which we're going to do some special racing, which only you'll be able to see. I'll see you then. All right. Was that? Yeah. Come and have a look at this one. <laughs> okay. Hi. Yes, then. Is that someone? Is it me? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank can, you. Can thank, you say, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Good. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The talking point between Nigel and Sheridan will almost certainly be the team's plans for next year. Although he's had an offer for another drive, Nigel's not committing himself before knowing who his partner will be. Hockenheim is a small village, famous only for its motor racing circuit. At 6.797 kilometres, one of the longest in use. The long straights make it probably the quickest circuit of all, and Nigel is first out of the starting box to set provisional pole position at 138.340, which would be two seconds quicker than anyone else. The Brazilian, Ayrton Senna, separates Nigel from Ricardo Patrese, who in turn keeps Gerhard Berger at bay. Very, very pleased today, um, mainly because in qualifying especially we we chose to go right uh, at the start of the session, which was um, a little bit of a guesswork, but uh, we played absolutely perfect because we're going rolling out the pits with 30 seconds to go for the pit lane to open for qualifying, and uh, I had two or three perfectly clear laps, no problems, no traffic, no flags, and we did uh, warm-up lap, then I did 1 minute 39.0 and then 1 minute 38.3. And uh, that was the pole time, which I set within basically the first six, seven minutes. And then after that, the incredible thing was I came in and we were going to do some work on the uh, race car with a less powerful engine and set it up. But then there was accident after accident and people going off and bringing debris and stones. And at one time it was that bad that they red flagged the qualifying session. So, you know, as it all turned out, we actually, uh, our planner campaign today worked uh, very, very well indeed, and the morning's warm-up uh, was probably equally as, uh, as good too. Were you racing the RS4 engine to start with? We were qualifying, we qualified the RS4, but we have uh, two cars here. My race car set up with the RS3 engine, which is the one that we're doing the race with and we've got to do our homework with, um, and qualifying the RS4, which is a more powerful engine. And uh, we're greatly encouraged because they have made good um, progress with the RS4 and, you know, touch wood at the moment, touching the table, um, it's very, very encouraging. And you were here, of course, a week earlier, uh, testing the RS4. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a circuit where we have a Foca test a week before the race and we did our homework very well last week and the car is set up, uh, I'd say, extremely competently. and. I'm very, very satisfied the way things have gone today and I'm greatly encouraged and I just hope that we have the reliability and we don't have any other problems. And is there more horsepower from the new engine? 
Yeah, there is, and you know, it's an ongoing development all the time. I mean, the RS3 has basically topped out, and but the RS4 now is, is finding new ground all the time. Renault's performance is no doubt a significant player in the who drives for whom drama still to be resolved. As a French company, not forgetting Elf Fuel either, they perhaps understandably would like a Frenchman driving the car, and Alain Prost is the obvious available choice. He'd not be Nigel's choice, wherein lies the heart of the dilemma facing Frank Williams, Renault and Nigel. All I'm going to say is that um, it's not going to surprise me when I find out next week that there's going to be changes and what those changes will be, um, I'm not quite sure. I think maybe Prost might be in the equation. Um, there might be a couple of other things in the equation too, but. I've been in the game long enough not to predict those kind of things. OK, here we go on a qualifying lap of the Hockenheim Grand Prix circuit. One of the, well, I think it's actually the fastest circuit in the world. If it isn't, then Monza is. But, I mean, we actually qualified at 138.3 this afternoon, which is an average speed of 155 miles an hour. That's pretty quick. We'll start at the start and finish line, which is just here. We come past there in fourth gear, changing up into fifth gear, braking just a little bit around the first corner and then accelerating up then into fifth and to sixth. Now at this point here we are doing about 240 kilometers an hour. At about this point here we are doing 300 kilometers an hour. And at this point we are doing 338 kilometers an hour and before the braking we're probably doing about 342 kilometers an hour. Accelerating through here, now you'll see on the television here and here where I'm putting the black dots, there are many, many bumps through this curb and the car is jumping all over the place and there's been an awful lot of complaints today and even in the testing last week and there's actually been a few accidents here today, one of which actually stopped official qualifying because the car went straight on across here and, and brought all the stones and sand across the track and it was so bad they had to stop it. And then through the chicane, very fast chicane, and again a chicane which is very, very important because your exit speed here is a very good spot along here to overtake a slower car. And if you can come out of this chicane quick because you're actually doing about 240 to 260 kilometers an hour through here on the exit, you get a slingshot down here then changing up to 5th to 6th and again up to about 340 kilometers an hour by this point here. Braking quite hard from 6th to 5th to 4th. Through here going into the stadium in 4th gear, keeping it in 4th gear and then braking very hard to 3rd to 2nd, round the hairpin in 2nd gear, accelerating to 3rd and into 4th momentarily and back to third for the double right-hander. Now it shows a little bit of a straight here, but the car actually, if I draw this corner for you on here, and I draw it a little bit bigger, it's actually like that. And it's, to drive around here, you drive it as one corner. You can see, you just drive it as one corner sliding, and it's at this point here, the whole car is in a four-wheel drift at about that angle sliding all the way along so if you if you see this just imagine that this is the car so by the time you're sliding around there and you get to here then you play with the power on the throttle and then you actually set the car up ready for this next corner which is very important again because this actually sees what speed you're doing on the start and finish line in third to fourth and here even on this short straight from there to there you are already at this point at 280 kilometers an hour. So it just goes to show how quick a Formula One car accelerates. There you have it, a complete lap, and if you do that with very few mistakes, you can actually do a lap time of 138.3. Saturday, and no matter how early it is in the morning, Nigel always obliges those waiting for his signature. Even a 10 Deutschmark note will suffice. Oh, no, no, I'm your
There you go. Thanks, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. It's a big weekend for Michael Schumacher driving his first Grand Prix in his home country. A little late this morning, 8 o'clock, just about to be part to the circuit. A bit a lot of traffic this morning. Um, really, a little bit of patience, see if the track's a little bit quicker. Got to do our homework today on full tanks. Uh, very, very long lap here. As you know, it's over 7 kilometres long and um, very, very important to make sure that the car's handling it correct on full tanks. Once we get that done, um, might even sit out this afternoon. If the track isn't any quicker, then I'll stop myself going out just to try and beat my own time. And, and hopefully, I, you know, the time I set yesterday will be quick enough for pole. If it isn't, then you'll see a good fight on our hands. Other than that, I'll see you this afternoon. See you later. Close to the circuit, the town of Heidelberg's combination of castle, river and old town makes it one of the most romantic in Germany. Situated on the river Neckar, 11 miles southeast of Mannheim, the ruins of its 13th century castle dominate the town. Ricardo borrowed Nigel's car to set an impressive time in qualifying. Schumacher spun in his bid to impress, and then, in the last minutes of the session, Nigel came out and claimed his ninth pole position of the season in 1 minute 37.960. The McLarens of Senna and Berger came next, followed by Alessi and Schumacher. Saturday night's entertainment was provided by Cannon. The champagne flowed freely and there was ample good food for the invited guests and the world's media. Well, you can have uh, another 30 seconds to practice. The BBC's Murray Walker was rehearsing for tomorrow's race, overseeing fair play in a remote control model race for anyone who fancied their chances. Cannon also supplied £20,000 worth of goodies for prizes in an organised draw. The Williams drivers, however, were to be the star attraction. Good evening, Sheridan. Good evening, Ricardo. And thank you. And thank you very much for coming. If you if you'd like to take one of these units and uh, comment, comment, Spinner, can you fix Ricardo up with a car? Nice so Colin Spinner here has actually got two of these superb Tamiya models. Hold it up, Colin. Let, let's have a look. This is, uh, there we are, there is Red 5 itself, the Canon Williams Renault of 1992, which Nigel has been driving, and I have no doubt that we have a white six somewhere or other. Right, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? Yes? Yes, right. Now, one, two, Three, go. Perfect start by Patrese. Straight into the first corner, around the hairpin. Now Patrese's got to keep it running smoothly. And it's a five lap race and Patrese's coming through to complete the first lap. He's already half a lap ahead of Martin Nigel Mansell who's putting up a terrific spurt to try and catch the white six car. And it, it's, it's hell up here, I'll tell you. Now where is Mansell? Where Patrese's gone through and completed two laps. Two laps for Patrese. Mansell is backing out of trouble and he's beached it. He's somehow got it over the arm co. Patrese's coming out of the hairpin, round the right hand, they're completing three laps. Mansell is on lap two and a half, I think. And Patrese so is on lap four. There's only one lap to go after this for white six. And Mansell is going berserk. He's, he's hit the armco left, he's hit the armco right. Meantime, Ricardo Patrese is leading. No, he's not, he's gone off. They've both gone off. And this is the last lap of the Canon German Grand Prix here at the Holiday Inn 
at Hoffenheim. Ricardo Patrese crosses the line. Five laps completed. And he's Very fair race. But it's the first time that Ricardo is going to get penalised for jumping the start this year. <laughs> Nigel, that was uh, quite a bit of fun in there with the cannon racing. Yeah, it was uh, good fun, and I know what Ricardo does in his spare time. Uh, I think uh, his his children are a little bit older than mine, so they don't uh, crash the cars too often. So you have to sort of put them back together. But it was a lot of fun. And at the circuit this afternoon, I gather you had to uh, lend, well, you didn't have to, but you did lend Ricardo your car. Yeah, I thought it was only right in case they had problems getting his car together that um, he had the opportunity to qualify in my car and get on the front row of the grid, which he did. And, uh, you know, um, I'm pleased he didn't go quicker than me, that's all. You only had uh, a short time at the end left, though, to make your time. Yeah, my first flying lap was the quickest lap, 37.9, and, uh, you know, it was good enough for pole position, but then we had a slight problem with the car. Um, one of the bolts underneath the floor sort of uh, got damaged and the floor dropped a little bit and the car wasn't handling as good as it should have been then so I aborted the second run. But that surely was a good example of how um, team members should behave. Well yes I think so but I mean in different circumstances you shouldn't have to do that. It was a big, big risk from my point of view today because I actually jeopardised pole position because uh, the McLarens were coming closer, they got within a second and uh, I felt that if they got a perfect lap together they could have beaten my time and uh, needless to say Ricardo got very very close and uh, in fact if he hadn't had his accident on the last run in his own car because he had a fresh engine uh, he might have even beaten it and if I'd have gone out in my car at the start of the session with it sort of working real well I could have probably gone a bit quicker than that you say. Now you won here at uh, Hoffenheim last year to complete your first career hat-trick. Are you, are you going to tomorrow's race with extra confidence? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm obviously going to tomorrow with a lot of, uh, uh, with a big positive attitude, I should say, but, you know, we've just got to get the job done tomorrow. It's not going to be that easy. I think McLaren on full tanks are a lot closer than us. I think we might be about half a second a lap uh, quicker, but where we're quicker is around some of the corners. Down the straights, there's nothing in it at all. I think there's less than one, mar uh, one uh, kilometre an hour. So, I mean, on the start, it's very, very, it's probably more important tomorrow to get the best start of this year tomorrow. Nigel remained in party mood, donning our equipment and playing at being a sound recordist. <laughs> no, thanks. To the complete astonishment of Sheridan. <laughs> And what will tomorrow hold in store for Nigel? <laughs> An early start on race day through the misty fields and rivers to the Waldorf where a different mode of transport awaits Nigel and Roseanne. Morning, gentlemen. To help beat race day traffic chaos, Sheridan arranged for this superbike through Renault France and Germany. And the price of this loan? Just autograph the tank, please. Oh, and the helmets. And of course, the Porsche. Hey. Good dog. I'll be with that. Something that's fair. Here. Morning. Blue suit. Red suit. See you later. You got the keys <coughs> over there. Even Nigel wouldn't get into the circuit without his Fulker accreditation. <laughs> this is the kind of message I remember. What's that? I'm not there for lunch. Uh, there Tom Walkinshaw, there. team principal of Benetton, prefers a more conventional mode of transport.
bang. Herzen nach glühen, Edelweiß blühen, wir klettern mit sicherer Hand. Herrliche Berge, sonnige Höhen, Bergfahrer wunden sind wir, ja wir. Herrliche Berge, sonnige Höhen, Bergfahrer wunden sind wir. of battle, Nigel is late braked by Senna and cuts straight across the second chicane, emerging in a cloud of dust onto the straight. But he soon overtakes Senna. Ricardo overdoes it, agonizingly just 500 yards from the finish line, and Nigel sails to his eighth win out of ten starts in a remarkable season. A proud moment on the podium too for Schumacher, who was gifted third place by Ricardo. Nigel's lead now in the Drivers' Championship is 46 points over the luckless Ricardo, almost beyond reach now in his life's quest for the title. And Team Williams march gloriously on in the Constructors' Championship. Under the watchful gaze of the Cathedral, Speyer's small airport awaits its busiest day of the year and the crowd awaits a triumphant night. A little bit tired. <laughs> they greet him enthusiastically and he obliges with some autographs and some very special gifts. Well, Nigel, very many congratulations. That's eight wins in one season so far, which equals out in Senna's previous record. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a little bit stunned sitting here because we had quite a few problems today in the race, and I pitted the tyres real early because I thought I had a puncher, and then I stayed on the uh, second set of tyres for the remaining laps, and at the end, the tyres were, well, they were completely shot. But I mean, we finished, we won, so I've got to be happy, but boy, am I tired now. And now uh, the Constructors title, I would think, seems fairly inevitable for, uh, for Williams. Well, it's very silly, but, you know, I'm the last one to look at the points. I don't know what the point situation is in the Constructors or the drivers, so... Um, but I would think that... Um, with only six races left, the constructors' uh, title should be Williams and Renault's. Uh, as for the drivers' title, um, you know, there's still a mathematical chance of two of the drivers that can possibly win, so I'm not going to um, tempt Providence in any way or form. I've been uh, the bridesmaid uh, three times before, and, you know, this time I want to try and make it, and I've just got to go to Hungary with a very positive attitude and uh, just feel that. Uh, 
you know, it's another race, and if we can obviously get first or second place there, I believe then mathematically uh, the championship's mine. But you know, that's only because someone's told me. Um, I've just got to wait and see. Um, it's still a long way to go. And I gather that uh, the journey here to the airport on on the motorcycle was almost as hair raising as the race itself. Yeah, the police here um, gave us an escort on the motorbike, and we were going quite quick, and it was it was very interesting. <laughs> Having driven the race and then driven here on a on a quite a large motorcycle, uh, you know, needless to say, I admit to being very tired now. We expected to see Roseanne struggling with the trophy on the back there. Yeah, unfortunately, the trophies were sort of too big to uh, get on the motorbike, so they're going to come to my home next Friday. So um, you know, we'll get them there, but it won't be till the end of the week. So that's 29 career wins for you. I mean, Senna with 34, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you'll overtake him this season and, and be second best driver of all time behind Frost? No, I don't think so. Um, I'll just be happy with a couple of more wins if I can. One more win will do me this year um, and then we'll just see what happens. A magnificent. Congratulations again and we look forward to catching up with you in Hungary next time. Thank you very much. See you then. Nigel jets home to the Isle of Man close to realising his dream, but no doubt pondering his future. If Nigel Mansell wasn't a racing driver, he'd have chosen to be either a golfer or a footballer. That's why he jumped at the chance to meet one of England's most successful managers, Brian Clough. His team will now share a common sponsor with Nigel's Williams team, Labatt's Canadian Lager. <laughs> That's the first that he found, I'm killing. Both men have an inborn desire to succeed, tempered with a mischievous sense of humour. This way, please. It was an absolutely fantastic day at Nottingham Forest and to be with Brian Clough and uh, Stuart Pearson, uh, the captain, and uh, obviously Nigel Clough, uh, Brian's son, and all the other rest of the boys, uh, they were super, thorough professionals, and uh, I mean, to be there in the, in the middle of the park uh, with the new grandstands being erected to the right and obviously hearing about the new ones going to be there behind us as well to the north, uh, sensational. and. Uh, it will be a day that I'll certainly remember for the rest of my life and I know my two children will because I mean you'll have footage of them kicking the ball and playing and uh, it was uh, one of the uh, better sporting moments that uh, you can remember nicely. You can't fail to enjoy it and he's not five foot eleven either standing on his tiptoes but um, he comes across as such a nice person and when I was even doing some shopping yesterday and I was bragging the fact that I might possibly get the chance to meet him people in shops, ladies say he comes across as a nice person and he is what he is and that makes a good champion as well as talent. I was going to say he is a winner which is nice as sure well. Sure is. You've got to be a winner and then you come across as well as a nice person. He's got, he's got everything going for him at the moment and I hope it continues until he retires for 20 years when he's won this championship. Both men are used to tackling the opposition, but it's Brian here who gets the last laugh. <laughs> Ronald's Way Airport on the Isle of Man. And today, Nigel begins a journey which could ultimately fulfil his lifetime's burning ambition. The private jet is bound for Budapest in Hungary for round 11 of the Formula One World Drivers' Championship where Nigel can possibly clinch his first World Championship title. We join Roseanne Mansell and Sheridan Thin on this momentous journey. Despite the pressures of the current situation, the atmosphere is surprisingly casual and relaxed.
Well, good morning to you, everybody. Uh, welcome, and I'm glad you could join us here on this uh, British Aerospace uh, 1000 aircraft. It's a corporate jet, one of the latest ones of its kind. And uh, we're presently an hour and a half into our journey to Budapest. Budapest, as you will see, is a very interesting uh, city. And uh, obviously the venue for the 11th round of the Formula One Grand Prix Championship. What can I say about the championship at this time? It's been marvellous, hasn't it? Eight wins out of ten races. A second at Monte Carlo, which we perhaps could have won. And now going to Budapest with uh, bated breath because Yes, you're right. If we win here in Budapest this weekend, that elusive world championship could be ours, or will be ours, I should say. A lot of controversy has been happening this last couple of weeks on um, where drivers might be going. Will Nigel Mansell stay with Williams? Will Prost join Williams? Will Senna go to Ferrari? And of course, uh, the biggest controversy of it all this last week has been the fuel. All fuel from all present uh, and races we've had this year have been totally banned. It's been ter interpreted by FISA now that power boosting additives are uh, not permitted in Formula One. Therefore, now the only fuel you can use at a race is what is known as pump fuel or fuel available to the public. Now, this is very uh, ambiguous because who defines pump fuel from one country to another? How do you police it? And we're talking of 50 to 60 horsepower difference with the fuels we've been using, so the fuels we'll have to use now in Hungary. I think there'll be a lot of trouble. I think there'll actually be a lot of court cases about this. But it goes without saying that we are playing as fair as we can. We're going to pump fuel now, which normal cars use on the street. Because if you don't, FISA have the powers to disqualify you from the championship and in doing that, I mean, it goes without saying, that would be totally undesirable. But to change the regulations halfway through the season is almost unheard of. And therefore, I'd say this to you, that I'm keeping well out of it, I'm keeping my head down, I'm going to try and have a quiet weekend. And the most important thing to do this weekend is qualify at the front of the grid. Why? The circuit here is just as bad as Monte Carlo for overtaking, almost impossible, and therefore a premium is on qualifying. We'll have to be patient. I will ask you to join us, and next time I'll be speaking to you is uh, probably at the hotel by the side of the Daniel. You catch up with us then. We're going to have a fantastic weekend, I hope, and you'll be there to watch it. We touch down safely at Budapest just two and a half hours flying time in this luxury jet from Nigel's Isle of Man home. So Nigel disembarks in Hungary on the threshold of a title success already denied to him on three occasions. Budapest is the country's capital and lies on both sides of the river Danube. Buda and its hills to the west of the river and the plains of Pest to the east. They became one city in 1872, being joined by this, the Chain Bridge, designed and built by British engineers William and Adam Clark. At the Forum Hotel in Pest, Nigel takes time out for a special occasion. On his birthday here last year, he was presented with an unusual gift. Not one to look a gift horse in the mouth, Nigel offered it for auction, the proceeds going to help the famous Peto Institute for Sick Children. It raised half a million Hungarian forints. <laughs> Friday, and today's first qualifying session is vitally important. So it's off to the circuit very early. No, not really. No. Well, I don't know how things are going to turn out today. I mean, awful lot of uh, things happening at the circuit. There's a few ultimatums flying around as well as to when perhaps one should make one's decision, like yesterday. But the fuel situation is the biggest thing on my mind today and the performance of the car. I've learned that a lot of teams have learned. Uh, through testing that they've learnt 
that they've lost no performance at all, whereas we've definitely lost a lot of performance on our fuel. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting day, but I think a very trying one for a number of reasons. One probably with, of which I'll tell you tonight, but uh, there's a lot of things afoot and uh, it's probably going to be uh, one of the most critical three days in my life uh, in motor racing. And I'll catch up with you later. And as normal, the first day I'm late. Didn't have a very good night, but uh, can't really blame it on anything other than the mind working overtime. Nigel's relaxed disposition of yesterday is replaced by tension today. There isn't much conversation on the 20 minute journey to the circuit as Nigel is deep in thought. It's ironic that the Hungaro ring, a circuit Nigel's not fond of, could hold the key to all his aspirations. Here we are at the circuit, and you're on the, uh, the main gate now, and no doubt you'll be filming some of the circuit and get a couple of the corners where we'll be going round. As I said, probably going to be one of the toughest days in my life because of the concentration, the fact of the championship, and a lot of things going on I can't talk to you about at this moment, but uh, we'll certainly enlighten you as the weekend goes on. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Qualifying at the 3.968 km Hungaro ring circuit didn't exactly go Nigel's way. He had to be content with second place behind his teammate, Ricardo Patrese, after a frustrating session. We've only uh, got uh, second place today. My teammate's on pole. Uh, he beat me by two tenths of a second, but we've had um, a lot of problems. I went out in my tea car first of all this morning and uh, lost it because uh, it basically stopped out on the circuit. That created quite a lot of interest. Uh, I just had to wait for a long time for the marshals to push me in a safe position at the end of the pit lane. Um, then my race car was going reasonably well until then I came into the pits and uh, part of the asbestos sheeting caught fire by the engine and we, so we had a fire in the pits then which we had to put out with extinguishers. Uh, that delayed us for another 20 minutes and then I had quite a lot of problems trying to fix the car and get it to go quickly and um, then of course uh, just like the big bang of thunder then uh, we had a lot of hiccups on the circuit trying to get a free lap and uh, unfortunately we didn't, we didn't quite do it. It's, it's been one of the hardest days so far this season and, uh, you know, um, we've basically got to be patient and just hope that, uh, that we can have a much better day tomorrow. Good night, Friday evening. See you Saturday. Saturday now, and one more chance to gain the coveted pole position that could be so crucial this weekend. Yeah, not too bad. I mean, the weather's looking indifferent, a bit windy, but uh, we need to uh, try and get on pole position today. Um, I had a better night's sleep, so I'm hopefully fired up a little bit better today. The cars will operate, I think, uh, a little bit fairer, so uh, I might be able to get the job done today. We'll see. You'll uh, be speaking to us later and I have, have some uh, good news for you. As Nigel speeds off to the circuit, we take a more leisurely look at Budapest's bounty.
back in the forum after the second qualifying session, but it's not good news. No improvement on yesterday's times for the Williams pair, and a dramatic 11th hour spin into the bargain. Yeah, it was uh, one of those situations and the tracks, I'm afraid, one of those circuits that uh, a lot of the corners are blind and I was on a really hot lap. In fact, my split time on that lap when I had the accident was a 15-3 which would have put me on pole position but uh, it's um, you know, one of those things that uh, you come up on a, a three car or four car accident and uh, there's debris on the circuit and dust and I came around this one corner just the corner in front of the accident no flags nothing and um, it's just like driving on oil and car just went into a big spin a very big slide and then straight into the barrier so you know, we're lucky it wasn't uh, a bigger accident. But and you're, uh, you're okay yourself? Yeah, I mean, my shoulder's hurting and my neck's aching, but that's normal after you've had a 160-mile-an-hour accident. So, um, you know, but it's quite strange. In 150 yards, there was uh, four or five accidents all on the same lap. It's not going to be any Sunday afternoon drive tomorrow, that's for certain. It's going to be very, um, very hot, very tiring. Uh, one of the longest races in, in the Grand Prix calendar, I mean, it'd be 1 hour 50, 55 minutes tomorrow, so uh, it's going to be a tough old uh, race, 77 laps. Well, here we are on the, on the eve of what could be your crowning glory. Any last minute advice or that's from Frank Hill or the rest of the team? Um, no, other than the fact that I'm probably uh, disappointed uh, because you'd think that um, there'd be some kind of team orders, but uh, there isn't, it's a free-for-all. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I think, a little bit silly, because if we could get uh, a little bit of assistance tomorrow, then uh, it could be all out of the way and done and dusted, although anything can happen, as we know. And then we can have a free-for-all for the next five races, but uh, they want a free-for-all all all the time. That's fine. But it just makes it a bit more difficult. Sure. But I think Ricardo knows the score regarding the championship. Do you think he's not given any ground, perhaps, or he can't win, can he? He knows. He knows that, but he knows that you can. Well, he can mathematically. I mean, if he was to win the next six races and I don't finish, we will be driving with as much calm and composure and as fighting spirit as the circuit will allow us because the circuit is not what I call a proper racing circuit. Um, We will all have to be patient and, and see what happens. I'm really looking forward and hope dearly that I can get a good night's sleep tonight. Although there's lots of other pressures with contracts and people pushing and pressurizing you and pulling you in different directions. Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But uh, I think at this moment in time, I want to try and be very quiet and uh, go and soak my weary body in a nice hot bath tonight. Perhaps you just talk us around a quick uh, lap of the circuit before we let you go to the bath. Okay, coming around on the qualifying lap or racing lap, you come out of this turn 13 very quickly in third gear, chaining up to fourth, to fifth, and at this point doing 250 kilometers an hour. At sixth, sixth, and here, you are doing something like 270 to 280 kilometers an hour. And this is where all the accidents were, right here, and this is where my accident was here. And that's because a lot of dust was coming up on the circuit and the dust uh, basically was turning the circuit into uh, basically an ice ring. Breaking very hard now, down to second, then up to third, staying in third, and then coming round back onto the main straight in third. The most crucial corners for a very, very quick lap and also to position yourself to the point of view of possibly overtaking cars tomorrow is turn 13, which one has to say is lucky for some, and turn 3. The reason for this, you can see how short a straight this is, it's nothing. And therefore your exit speed here, your car must be very quick at this point to then slipstream another car down the straight to try and overtake on the inside or even maybe on the outside going into turn 1. Equally when you go down the hill in turn 2, Exit in turn three, you have a small straight, which is very small. I mean, that's only probably about 600 yards long. And um, if you can get a very good exit speed out of turn three, it may be possible to squeeze in before the next corner. But those are the only two.
possible overtaking positions. This one is far less than obviously the pit straight. So as you can see, if you can make the first corner in first into the lead, the chances are you can win the race. Otherwise, you've got a very, very tough uh, race on your hands tomorrow, which actually takes 77 laps, which is better part of two hours. One of the hardest races in the calendar, and if it's hot tomorrow, certainly uh, one of the most sapping. There you have it. I'll invite you to the race tomorrow. I'm now going to leave you. It's coming up half past seven in the evening here, and uh, I shall be in bed within the next hour. Race day, and the Ferrari team leave the hotel for their 500th Grand Prix. A lot's expected of their young French driver, Jean Alessi. Benetton prepare to leave for the circuit too, along with the English driver, Martin Brundle, and the German, Michael Schumacher. Nigel, as ever, obliges an early autograph hunter. Here we are anyway, we've arrived at the uh, most important day, probably in my Grand Prix uh, career. Police have just come for me. Um, what can I say, except it's going to be very, very hot. It's a lovely morning at the moment. Uh, Warm up this morning is going to be very important to try and set the car up and make sure the engine's working well. We have a fuel uh, consumption problem here. It's one of the longest races in the calendar. Some of the things I'm repeating, but I'm just refreshing your memory that uh, all the things I have to go through this morning. Fuel consumption, the tyre pressures are very important here if they can get away from you as well. Tyre wear. You don't really want to make a pit stop here unless you have to because it's like Monte Carlo for overtaking. Uh, besides all that, it's a very easy day. I wish it was. Anyway, we're just about to go and uh, you'll see how it goes and you'll catch up with me later today where hopefully uh, we'll celebrate or commiserate together. The sponsors, as usual, have thought up every conceivable way to advertise their product. Will they have a winner on their hands today? At the Hungaro ring, the spectators travel in by car, bicycle, or on foot. And Hungarian handicrafts mingle with the usual Grand Prix side stalls of drinks and mementos. There are some strange spectators, too. Patrese makes another superb start, but he chops Nigel into the first corner, allowing Senna and Berger to get past, leaving Nigel in fourth place. Recovering composure, Nigel fights his way past Berger's McLaren into third. A mistake by Patrese finishes his dreams as he spins off. All Nigel has to do now is finish in the top three to grasp the title. But there's a puncture warning, tyres are change, and Nigel rejoins down in sixth place. He goes flat out. He passes Hakkinen, and then Brundle, and Berger for the third time in the race. Nigel crosses the line in second, and his dream has come true. He's the world champion. For the record, Berger finished third, Hakkinen fourth, Brundle fifth, and Capelli got one point for Ferrari in their 500th race. And there's the confirmation. Nigel, 52 points ahead of Patrese now, with only 50 points left to score this year. Nobody else can do it. Williams walk away with the Constructors' race, a truly magnificent team effort. The jet that began this historic journey waits to speed the new champion home. Dehydrated, he toasts success with two soft drinks. It's fantastic. We're on the way back home to the Isle of Man. 
I don't know whether it has sunk in yet. I mean, I've got this silly smile on my face, and I've just about gathered my breath, and you know what I mean? Oh, it's just the most fantastic feeling and the best day in my life. That's that fast if you talk about the championship or the uh, You can't avoid it now. No, I suppose I can't, can I? I mean, I've got to talk about it now. I mean, I keep looking at the points and seeing that I'm 52 points ahead with only five races to go, so I'm slowly thinking and working out that no one can catch me, so... But it is unbelievable to be the uh, 1992 world champion of Formula One, and absolutely marvellous. I would imagine that deep down you're really pleased uh, as much as yourself uh, for Rosanne. Rosanne's been the trump card in my whole life. If I'd not made, if I'd not met Roseanne and I'd not married Roseanne, I wouldn't be sitting here now. She's the most marvellous woman that any man could wish to have as a wife. Yep. And I'm pleased there's only one of her. You cast your mind back to the 12 years when you really were struggling to, to get in and, and on the bottom run of the ladder towards your ambition. And you think about all the hardship and frustrations you went through then, it's all been worthwhile now. Yeah, one could say today's made it all worthwhile. At home, a very special welcome awaits Nigel at the tiny airport. <laughs> I wouldn't count anything until the second flag was out and I knew what the point of the situation was. It was just lovely, especially if I was there as well. Overcome with emotion from the Islanders' greetings, Nigel's escorted to his car. Above the bay of Port Erin, a new day dawns, the first one in the reign of Nigel Mansell as the new king of Formula One. A top-of-the-range Renault GTA sports car bears testimony to the harmony of man and machine. A champagne cork says it all. Complete joy for a family finally fulfilled after all the heartaches. Yes, I've been privileged and proud to know and follow the career of Nigel since his very earliest Formula Four days in single-seaters. I remember in Silverstone once, sitting on the front wheel of this Formula Ford car with this young chap called Nigel Mansell sitting inside it and no one had ever heard of and I'd been watching him during practice and thought that this was someone I ought to go and talk to and that was the first time I'd spoken to him and I've been with him and following his career ever since. He's a very special sort of person when you think about it. I mean Nigel was, wasn't exactly brought up in poor circumstances, he, he had a very good childhood but he's made the most of his life and to become world champion after all the problems that he's had to overcome and, and to be able to live here in his home in Florida, it make, makes me feel very proud for him. He's a gifted driver and he's enormously capable, obviously, but he's made himself what he is by sheer determination and guts and, and the refusal ever, ever, ever to give up keeps on going and he, he, he won't take no for an answer at the wheel or anywhere else for that matter. I, I quite genuinely had a, a break in my voice and a, a problem getting the words out because as I say when you, when you followed someone and he's a personal friend he's the first world champion in my time and I have been talking about Grand Prix racing since 1949 that's a long time He's the first world champion, I can say, he's a personal friend. And uh, yes, there was a break in my voice and uh, a tear in my eye, and, and I'm, I'm glad to admit it. I'm actually savouring all what we have gone through to, to get where we actually find ourselves today, which is, uh, is truly magnificent. And of course, there's still five races left in the calendar this year. Well, five races where the pressure will be off of me, so it might even be that I'll go even quicker now. I haven't sort of got to worry about the championship, and. I can go out there and just drive and uh, drive with ease. You've also achieved it as well amidst all the um, disquiet about who's going to drive for who next year. Well, I know. I mean, to keep your, your mind on the job, especially with doing that, and 
negotiations starting from Mexico this year, but I've always been comfortable and I've always, always believed that what goes around comes around. I certainly hope I'm able to defend it uh, next year with the same team, but I'm afraid that's out of my hands. But I'd just like to finish in saying to all of you out there who's watching this, a very, very big thank you, because this is world, this world championship that we managed to win after 30 years, if you like, because that's the first time I drove a car, eight, nine, uh, when I was eight or nine. Um, it's partly yours. I mean, you gave me the support, you gave me the encouragement, and you all made me unretire two years ago. And we did it all for the right reasons. Thank you very much.